the record button here. If uh, if you would rather uh, not be recorded, please go incognito, turn your camera off and change your name or remove your name. Uh, we're not recording the contents of the breakout sessions, so there's no worry there. We also have closed captioning available this time uh, for the first time in Peerpocalypse history. So if you're interested in using the, uh, the closed captioning, uh, just hit the drop down box and choose how you would like to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, conference uh, comfort agreements are on page seven in our conference program or listed on the Peerpocalypse website. There's also extra support for those of you that may need it, peer support for peer support. At any time you need, please re please visit uh, www.peerpocalypse.com for a list of the on-call peer support specialists. And we ask that you keep yourselves on mute. If you have any questions or comments for the presenter, please use the chat box. All right. And uh, Danielle, uh, and Sadie, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sadie Thompson. I'm the Chief Implementation Officer for the Wellbeing Initiative in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, we have the statewide consumer network for Nebraska, as well as um, several other programs. I'll let Danielle introduce herself. Hey everyone, it's so great to see all of you. I see so many pages that I, I wish I could see you all on the front screen, but um, I am Danielle Smith. I am the Chief Visionary Officer of Wellbeing Initiative. Um, I'm also the Project Director for our Statewide Consumer Network. And um, we're on round two, so we're really excited and we're really excited about presenting today. So nice to meet all of you. I will be monitoring the chat box. So um, if you have questions for us, um, feel free to ask why Sadie's presenting and um, I will get you your information. Awesome. Okay. Um, Marianne, I've been letting people in, but um, if you could take that over from here forward, I will, because um, I'll probably be focusing on the presentation. Thank you. Um, I will do that. Awesome. Thank you. I uh, wasn't sure how many people we were going to have, and I thought maybe we would be able to do, <laughs> this is funny now, be able to do some type of introductions, but I think we would spend the entire um, hour and a half introducing ourselves to each other. So that's not going to happen. Um, I have seen lots of uh, people commenting in the chat box their their hellos. So um, you will have time. We will have a couple breakout sessions. You'll have time to kind of get to know one another um, in that. And then we'll also have a five minute break. Um, I'm uh, Danielle and I kind of like to wing it and go with like the energy of our presentation and the group. So we'll kind of find our five minute uh, break as to like how the group is feeling. Um, if you have any questions or need me to stop and kind of re-explain anything ever, just unmute yourself and interrupt me. Please interrupt me. I also want this to be a conversation. I love our presentations to be conversational. So um, if I'm just flying through info and you're like, hold up, can we have a conversation about that? Yes, the answer is yes, interrupt me. I will not be offended. Um, does everyone have the ability to use like their thumbs up on their Zoom like this? Boop. Yes. A lot of- I do. Okay. Awesome. So, um, when we do peer support training on Zoom, we use our thumbs up to make sure that everyone's cool because uh, we believe in everyone being ready to go for the next portion of information and not leaving anyone behind. So I might ask you to give me your thumbs up or a thumbs down if you are needing more time. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see this? Looks like it. Yep, we got a thumbs up for Marianne. All right, cool. Um, so just a, a brief intro. Uh, the reason we're doing uh, information about supervision and co-reflection is one, um, we 
combined have a lot of experience um, supervising uh, peer support staff in different both integrated and peer run agencies and um, that can be one of the biggest barriers to employing peer support in Nebraska anyway is supervision issues and then also when we were at the INAPS conference a couple of years ago we talked about co-reflection and there were quite a few people that we're asking us, what is co-reflection? I wanna do that, what does that look like? Um, and so co-reflection is a really important piece of co-supervision between peer supports. Um, and we're gonna talk about the difference between those two and how uh, you can use those to improve your peer support services at your agency and decrease burnout for peer support specialists at your agency. Does that sound good to everyone? Yeah. Okay. So retention. Um, can I get just a, a quick raise of hands of how many people have seen peer support leave the field because of burnout? Okay, there's a couple. Yeah, they all have hands up. Okay. Yeah, lots of hands up. Okay. So um, unfortunately, Peer support is like, oh yeah, there's lots of hands. Okay, um, so easy to, to get burnout out in. And um, one of the things we wanna focus on is, is not losing really awesome peer support specialists to burnout. And so retaining them is super important. Um, it can feel like a balancing act, uh, but we know that there's one key element that has to be prioritized um to in order to maintain peer support staff does anybody have any ideas about what that element might be you can just shout it out if you do respect i have a quick comment yeah i think i go back to the actual interview when we all got our jobs, there were other people that they interviewed for that position and we were chosen out of all the other you know, candidates. And so I feel loyalty and commitment because I know, and I'll always know there's always someone smarter than me and probably someone that could have done the job a whole lot better, but I was chosen. So I feel committed and dedicated. And that raises me to say, Clients are the most important people also, but I just feel there's a driving force for me to stay committed, not have any burnout or compassion fatigue because I was chosen over someone else. That makes me feel obligated. Okay, so I what I heard you say was that um, you you want to stay committed because you were chosen to do that work. And even though there might be someone who could do it better, you were chosen for the job. And so it's your responsibility to make sure that you're staying well. That's true. Okay. So we have a lot of different answers on here. We've got self-care, boundaries, good supervision, respecting, connection open communication, parallel process and awareness. And so, and then someone said, well said, so. Awesome. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about workplace wellness and what all that entails for peer support anyway. Um, so we often focus our attention on the well being of others in peer support and in healthcare in general. Um, although the culture of our field is changing, uh, it's still challenging to change the culture of our organizations. So how many of you, by a raise of hands, uh, work for an organization that has more than just peer support at their agency? Like they've got, okay, we've got one, several, okay. Several people work in integrated settings. Um, yeah, and so the culture of an organization that has doctors, uh, clinicians, um, therapists, nurses, uh, case managers, that culture can be a lot different than the culture of peer support alone. Um, 
implementing programs and uh, norms within your agency that reinforce self care. So a lot of you said self care and mental well being will improve your overall employee retention. So one of the cool things that we've found in our work is that um, employing peer support and allowing them to change the culture of integrated workplace settings um, actually improves the well being of other staff like therapists and case managers and nurses because that um, kind of culture of self care starts to come to the surface. Um, these programs both uh, are supported by and will support peer support specialists, as we all know. Um, so having peer support specialists being um, kind of the leaders of our organizational culture change or um, of our self-care culture can be a really great place for leadership for peer support. Um, and then lastly, because it's the norm for peers to utilize their lived experience as a tool to their employment, peers may be a, uh, great leaders for committees on well-being within your agency. So do any of your agencies have like uh, well-being or wellness committees that like focus on your organization's wellness at all? That's kind of a newer thing. A couple, okay. Cool, yeah, so having peer support either as the leaders or um, the uh, members on those wellness committees is uh, A plus for any organization. Uh, when I, I used to work for another organization, it was executives and clinicians and me, the peer director of peer support. And um, whenever they talked about, you know, like what do the staff think about this or how are they feeling about this specific wellness program or initiative that we've started, um, they would look to me because I'm the person that other staff actually felt comfortable talking to because I'm a peer support, right? Um, and I don't have any judgment and I'm just here as a person to talk to. So um, that's why we make uh, really great leaders in, in that aspect. Any questions so far or comments? about your own agency and experience with this. Good morning, Danielle. This is Brian Allen. Um, I'm a peer with Quest and we implement, well, first of all, we implement the IPS training in our department. Um, I do feel that's something that should uh, be an overall agency deal though. Um, however, um, when we're talking about workplace wellness, we have, we just um, have started, um, a program, it's the DEIJ, which is Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. Um, it's very, you know, uh, it is a very progressive um, agency. Um, we're fully uh, so like um, uh, we have co-reflection um, and we use the IPS model. Um, we have a plethora of uh, um, services that we can utilize as, as peers, you know, we um, have acupuncture, we have meditation, we have nutrition, we have a holistic approach with all that is entailed with uh, wellness. So um, I think it's very important that, you know, um, that I, I, I want to just share that and uh, good seeing you. Awesome. Um, so D-E-I-S, is that what you said? DEIJ, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. Okay, that's super cool. That's something that uh, we'll have to look into. And um, IPS is actually the training I was initially trained in um, several years ago. No, really I was great. in you, you trained me. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Um, all right, so um, let's see. We have some examples of workplace wellness. So both peer support specialists and younger generations enter employment with the assumption that their employer will support their mental and physical wellness. Some examples of workplace wellness and, and programs are uh, wellness committees. We talked about that. They provide activities and support employees within their close proximity to, um, in respect to their um, employee engagement, mental health and physical health. 
and uh, employee assistance programs. Uh, how many of you have an employee assistance program at your agency? Quite a few. Okay. Um, we have a whole other presentation about how peer support could be an employee assistance program within an agency, but that's for a different talk. Um, so employee assistance programs are like counseling and financial consultation, supplemental insurance and peer support for employees and families of the agency. Uh, well-being apps, so there's different apps that agencies can buy or utilize to help their employees and their participants um, stay on top of their well-being and use activities and learn different tools and stuff like that. Um, and also membership uh, discounts at health clubs. So uh, for those employees that get their wellness from working out, uh, a discount at a, a fitness club might be really helpful. And regular training and education around uh, physical and mental health. So um, how many of you get say that think that you get a uh, regular training for physical um, and mental health education throughout the year. Only a couple. Okay, we got we got a couple. So that's a super, um, in in my opinion, one of the best ways we can support people's wellness because my wellness is improved every time I learn new ways to support my own wellness. Do we have something in the chat box? <clears throat> Um, hey, Belle said, I heard from some, some peers that they get annoyed when their supervisor asks them about self-care because they feel as though it is not their business or that the supervisor is trying to be the peer's therapist. So if that is implemented into supervision structure, should that be the consent of the peer? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> any conversation about anything personal should be consent of the peer for sure. Um, and I think that that hits on something that we might talk a little bit more about later. Um, that, uh, sorry, I got distracted. That um, clinicians often end up supervising peer support specialists and that gets complicated because we do wanna have conversations around self-care, but the way a clinician might talk about it, um, the way a clinician might talk about it might really seem, um, you know, I guess, inappropriate for a peer support in supervision. Whereas uh, the way a peer support's gonna talk about self-care is gonna be much more casual and mutual. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Um, and then the last thing is adding check-ins regarding self-care into supervision structure. So um, we have that, we have an example of that for y'all. Hold on just a second. Um, while you find that, mind if I chime in? Not at all. This is Paul. I'm at the VA in Southern Oregon. And one of the things that we set up is we have an LRC and direct supervisors, but we were allowed and we, we really rallied for ourselves. We come in and we're in charge of our strategic planning for our goals. We, are, we have time every week to sit down and just decompress. Only peer supports, nobody else is invited. And it's just, we talk, we unload. Nobody else understands us, nobody else does this, but we actually went up and advocated for all this and our supervisors found the value in it and said, do it, what else do you need? That's fantastic. Um... Yeah, and it sounds like in your state, uh, supervisors are often clinicians also, but that what you're talking about is is kind of closely aligned with a co-reflection, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a little bit. Um, thank you for sharing that, Paul. Does anybody else have any other comments before we move on or is everyone cool with us moving on? I see some thumbs, okay. 
So those tips that we mentioned before can help improve our overall organizational culture and employee awareness around self-care. Um, we don't believe that peer support um, are the only ones that should focus on self-care. We just believe that peer support might be the best at exemplifying self-care. Um, so we kind of view peer support in a strengths, and from a strengths-based perspective also. Um, it is, however, the practice, uh, best practice to implement structured check-ins with peer support specialists around their self-care. So we have a tool for peer support specialists to check in about their self-care. We've actually used this check-in um, with clinicians that we were training on how to implement peer support services. And they found that, they found it really challenging too um, and challenging to their own beliefs about their levels of self-care. So um, we are going to go ahead and look at that and I'm gonna have you guys split up into small groups here. Um, so, uh, but not quite yet, sorry. Um, if everyone has a piece of paper or uh, something they can write on or take notes on, it can be your computer too. Um, we're gonna go through these questions and um, and then you guys will have a, a few minutes in your groups to kind of discuss uh, what you, what was surprising, what you think maybe areas you could work on, um, or what this told you about yourself. Then we'll come back together and look at um, kind of a tool that we use to determine what can, what we can work on along with this. So um, we're going to identify with the following statements, either as almost always, most of the time sometimes or almost never. Um, Danielle, would you mind reading the questions? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So can I get a show of hands when we got a paper or pen or we're ready to go so I don't jump ahead of everyone? Awesome, I got lots of hands coming in. All right, awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and read number one. I try to make people feel better when they are stressed. So one, almost always, two, most of the time, three, sometimes, and four, almost never. All right, number two, I feel weak when I make mistakes. Right, number three, I prefer to give rather than receive in relationships. Number four, the more, the more I achieve, the more value I have. Number five, whenever I see conflict, I feel the need to resolve it myself. Number six, I don't speak up when I feel it will create conflict. Number seven, sharing my sadness with others is difficult for me. Number eight is when someone needs help, I lose interest in my own desires. Number nine is conflict makes me very uncomfortable. And we're on number 10. I rarely tell others how I expect to be treated. Number 11, what others think of me is very important to me. Number 12, I feel bad when I can't solve other people's problems for them. Thirteen, most days I feel as though I have nothing left to give by the end of the day. Fourteen, I often take my work home with me. 
15, I will only ask for help if I seriously need it, but otherwise I keep my problems to myself. Sixteen is I don't enjoy having free time. Seventeen, when I say no to a request, I feel like I did something wrong. Eighteen, in my personal relationships, I prefer people who need me. And 19 is when I don't know how things will turn out, I get overwhelmed. And number 20, the last one, letting go of other people's actions is difficult for me. Okay, thank you, Danielle. All right, so now that we have our numbers, we should have 20 different numbers. Um, we can add those up. I'm just going to uh, review real quick this bottom part and then I'll split you guys up into groups to kind of have some discussion. But um, if you scored between 20 and 40, it might be time to look at the areas that could use the most improvement. Those would be the areas that we numbered a one or a two. Compassion fatigue is very likely with this amount of self care. Do I have someone chiming in? Oh, okay. I heard a, I heard some background noise. Okay. If you scored between 41 and 60, uh, what areas can you improve to increase your self-care? Compassion fatigue could happen within the next six months if we don't take action. And then lastly, if you scored between 61 and 80, it looks like you have good boundaries and a sense of your own needs. Keep it up. So this is entirely strengths based, right? We're not doing, we don't, we're not judging ourselves. We're not putting, um, you know, oh, I should or shouldn't. We're not shitting on ourselves about this. Um, we are just uh, looking at areas that we can improve, which is always what peer support do, right? Um, mm -hmm. So do I have someone wanting to comment? Okay. All right, we are gonna split up into groups and I can actually, I think, do that. Yes. Um, I have to stop sharing. Boop. All right. Breakout rooms. We how many people do we have in 59. here? 59. <laughs> oh 10. my gosh. Okay, so we're gonna do 10 rooms and we're just gonna automatically assign them. Um, any questions before we split off into our rooms, we'll come back in um, about 10 minutes. So you guys can just discuss your results of your self-care quiz. Everyone cool with that? All right, off you go. Open all rooms. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Hey, real quick, before we get started, is anybody else having a lot of trouble with the links? With the links? Yeah, I'm having a booger of a time registering for classes. It still keeps sending me back to yesterday's. Oh, are you going into the calendar where it shows uh, the May 8, 3, May 4 little calendar on the website? That's no, actually the printout for the presentations. Uh, yeah. uh, I dropped uh, Nicole and Rena a quick message, but I haven't okay. got a response yet. I was just wondering if anybody else was having trouble. I haven't so far. I've just clicked on May 4th and it took me where I wanted to go. Mm. Yeah, I clicked on May 4th for the afternoon and it took me back to May 3rd, a class that I didn't even want then. Mm. Well, Nicole's Nicole's your go-to person on that, so you you send it to the right person. Um, yeah, it's the government computer. It's got to be. <laughs> it's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you guys think of your scores? Mine's about where I expected it. 
I know I got stuff to work on and I'm pretty aware of it most times, but yeah, yeah we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't real surprised by mine. Um, I think if I had done this pre-pandemic, I would have had a much higher score and probably <laughs> fallen in that area of having great boundaries. Um, but I, I found myself at a 46 and a half. I could not choose a solid number on one of them. Um, <laughs> and I knew that. I knew I had some work I needed to do. Yeah, well, I was, I felt encouraged actually that I wasn't in the lowest one. So I was so, <laughs> when I was answering some of those questions, I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I, I think some of those, those questions are things I think about, or like, you know, you know, have some kind of internal narrative, like even just yesterday, I was like, it's okay to say no to people, <laughs> like, and then other ones, I, I, I don't really kind of consider how, how, how those might be affecting me, so I, I liked it. Like I would say after the pandemic really set in, I uh, got really relentless with my boundaries just for myself because it was just so much that was happening at the time in terms of the the chaos on the units and then you know even chaos in the break rooms and I got to a point where I was just like, all right, for me, I'm going to have to make sure that I'm able to be a rock in the midst of the storm and um, see my way through it. But even beyond that, be a hopefully a beacon of light to the people I'm working with. And so I just kind of got my boundary game together and I wasn't too, I wasn't too surprised with my score today, uh, but it de it's definitely work to maintain it. Like you were just saying, Emma, there's an internal dialogue I'm dealing with every day that's keeping me on track when I'm seeing a tendency to veer from saying no or wanting to please or you know wanting to diffuse conflicts that really aren't my conflicts. I just I remind myself that's not necessarily my problem is this a, if is everything still safe okay if, if everything is still safe it's not my problem um <laughs> but if, if it's getting to a point where safety is being compromised i might step in i have to have those little boundaries <laughs> of when i get involved and you know what i mean it helps me stay on track otherwise we'll be putting out fires everywhere <laughs> I've actually had to learn a new saying because of this. Um, new skills too. Last night I went out and played golf. I learned to laugh at myself. But the saying I like is, "It's not my circus. It's not my monkeys." <laughs> I think mine was pretty high because I am like in full burnout right now. Uh, and I would, I, uh, I recently, uh, over the last year and a half, became a manager, a peer manager. And, and then even more recently, within the last month and a half, uh, got another program with five brand new peer support specialists who were not trained to stay because their program was only supposed to be a 30-day program at a voluntary isolation motel uh, for COVID uh, folks. So um, nobody got the training that they needed and the program got extended and then they didn't have a manager. No one had had supervision in three months. And so I came into like total chaos. I mean, we've already had a lot of uh, spot fires <laughs> and, and the, a very toxic uh, type of environment to go into because everybody uh, is on each other's nerves down there. And um, there wasn't anybody there for weeks and weeks and weeks. And now there's like 50 some people there all of a sudden, like in one day, the whole, the whole motel will fill up. And then, you know, but there's, 
no one was trained. And, and then I come along and I'm like, super peer support specialist, you know, I know, you know, what peer support specialists do and nobody wants to listen to me because I'm just another, I'm just another person. I mean, they've had two directors uh, and another person come in and train him and, and n- nobody actually trained them to stay. And so running across that and it's like going into an environment where you don't even feel welcome, but you know, that's not how it's supposed to feel. So it's just really super hard lately. And not getting good supervision myself is just, yeah. Very challenging. My hat goes off to you, Marianne. I worked yeah. at a place, I had six supervisors switch out within maybe eight months. And that can do damage to the morale of a group. So I kind mm-hmm. of feel what you're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I feel leadership. Uh, I really shy away from the word supervisor and all this. It's just a throw in. But I really, really work with my people, including my supervisors, to become leaders. And I'm lucky because the people that I've got to work with believe the same as I do. And so we do work with a leadership mode. And as long as I'm doing the right thing, they, you know, we had a deal out there. If you support me, I support you. And we both know that each other is going to do the right thing. So I'm super lucky in this. Well, I got here a little late and, um, and I want to make sure I'm in the right one. It's supervision and co-reflection for CP. Okay, great. But yeah. I, I did take some of the tests and is it the high number that's not good? No, I think <laughs> I, I, I was at 41 and I only answered, well, I answered half of them, I think. So is that right? Anyway, so I still have stuff to, I still have stuff to work and I noticed by some of the questions and um, I can kind of relate to Marianne. I started new as a manager, but I'm all, I'm really just supervising one. Is this about supervision, like supervising peers? And yeah, so I'm supervising one, but it's still overwhelming to supervising one peer and plus managing two different programs. And But I have the support, so you've got four. Yeah, so, but I, yeah. I've actually in three different counties. Yeah, I see. Your name sounds very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> it says as well. Yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah, support. We need support too. <laughs> That's for sure. It's super lonely because the thing that uh, connected you, you no longer do unless you ha- have the luxury of having a few peers yourself. The thing that, that connected you, yeah, that, that direct services with people and seeing that hope. Uh, you no longer do. So it's super isolating. Yeah. So you're not doing direct peer support. You're doing more managing. Um, no, yeah. I don't do direct support anymore. I wish yeah. I could just go back to that because that was yeah. a clear day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I know what you mean yeah. by that. Yeah, it's hard. I was saying that to a colleague over the weekend, but then I, I actually laughed at myself and thought the idea of me taking on actual um work with the community right now no i can support others doing that work i mm-hmm. cannot get myself into it these days i might be further into burnout than i realize <laughs> yeah i'm i'm supporting i love my job yeah. i just don't want to get up and go in <laughs> yes yeah, yeah it would be Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and and share my screen again. I hope you all had some good combo um, around that. We're going to talk a little more in depth about it. So we're going to look a little deeper. So upon further investigation, there's usually a theme to which questions are scored lower than others. Some of these themes include fear of vulnerability, taking responsibility for other people's feelings, issues around self-worth, lack of mutuality in relationships, 
and being too hard on ourselves. Um, of course, there's other there's other issues, there's other things that come up. Um, and this isn't a end all be all by any means. It's just kind of a generalization for us to kind of reflect about. So um, as you can see, a lot of these questions overlap with each other. Like, um, let's see, number 15 is in several, is in uh, our issues around self-worth and fear of vulnerability. So we just look at which numbers of questions we scored the most low numbers in. So if I have like four, eight, 11, 15, and 17, I know that I'm probably more leaning in the areas of issues around self-worth. Um, all of these are kind of to be kept private. So when we do co-reflection, we might share with our other peers. Um, we don't necessarily need to share with any clinicians or anything. Um, what exactly our issues of um, self-care are, but they're for us to reflect on and to improve upon for ourselves. So um, open, honest, non-judgmental exploration of these themes and improvement in these themes will help peer support specialists feel engaged, invested in, and empowered to continue personal growth. Does anybody have any comments for the big group about this uh, about this exercise or that wants to kind of tap into one of these areas or these themes and talk about their own self care in regards to these themes. Well, I definitely know that my issues around self worth are work in progress. And so that when I am in these situations um, where there's a hierarchy, I always put myself at the bottom of the totem pole. And um, I'm so grateful for my self care because I am working my way up the totem pole. <laughs> awesome. And did you find that those number uh, numbers of questions kind of lined up with that i haven't i haven't compared this particular slide to the to the questionnaire so i'm i haven't but i will okay i would like to have both of these the this slide and the questionnaire because i know awareness is the enemy of suffering and so i love this awareness <laughs> uh, you yes Awareness is the enemy of suffering. Thank you for that, Julie. I'm going to log that in my mind. Yay. Uh, we are gonna share these slides. We will ask at the end, um, if you guys are willing to put your email in the chat box and then we will happily share these slides in the form of a PDF for all of you. So we have one question, Sadie. Can you elaborate on the lack of mutuality in relationships? Yeah, so, um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I can find myself being like the listener, the person that people come to and not a lot of people, if I'm not careful, will know what's really going on with me. Um, I know what's going on with them and I'm their person and, but they don't know what's going on with me. And that lack of mutuality eventually leads to burnout for peer support because we're trying to be authentic, but we're not really being authentic if we're not being mutual in our relationships. Um, does that better kind of help explain that? Let me unmute. Um, yeah, a little bit, but I guess, so with that, um, so it's, you know, I mean, because I, I think our jobs is to listen and I'm not going to talk to my clients about what I've got going on. I mean, I, I disclose some stuff, but I, but I guess maybe it's, are you talking about like finding other people to talk to? I, I guess, I mean. So I suppose it, it depends on what kind of brand of peer support you're doing. Um, but, uh, 
you know, I'm not going to share the nitty gritty details necessarily of what I'm what's going on in my life with participants, but I will absolutely let them know if like I'm having a hard day, like, okay. I don't, you know, and um, I want them to feel like they're getting the real me and not the polished me. Um, that being said, you might your work might have different boundaries than that. And in that case, I would say, it's really important for me to have outside relationships that have real mutuality as well. That makes sense. Anybody else have any other comments? I have a comment. <clears throat> so <clears throat> because of the field that we're in, it's sometimes there's this thin line that um, it's draw or that is kind of um, blurry where where you work with other folks that have mental health issues in your office and there's that line where you're trying to do self care but where too much is being shared right so now I, not only do I have to take on my peers um, uh, mental health issues but now I also have to take on my coworkers mental health issues right so there's that line of like and i get it right but there's that line where where does it's the line drawn where like well this is too much for me to handle because i'm also dealing with my stuff and my peers and my co-workers right so um there's that that's always kind of lingering there how do you do self-care with that absolutely alex that's a um i think i probably spent the first 15 years of my attempted recovery was a recovery it just I wasn't I wasn't necessarily well at the beginning of it but um feeling like that like other people's stuff weighed on me um and then I kind of looked a little bit at am I taking you know should other people's stuff be weighing on me or am I taking on responsibility for what they're experiencing um and in peer support, one of the best things we can do is like be supportive without carrying it for someone, right? Like I'm, I'm here with you and with this heavy load, um, but I'm not carrying it for you. Um, and so that boundary for myself is internal. Um, am I taking responsibility for what's happening to my coworker, friend, participant? Um, and if so, where do I need to draw a line for me? Do I need to have a practice that after work every day, I disconnect from work and that's not my business, right? Um, or, or what does that look like? Um, that, that's just my experience. I don't know if anybody else has any other experience of, uh, with the heaviness of other people's experiences weighing on them. Can I chime in on that? Totally. Okay, so I think for me, I feel when I walk through the dark and heavy with somebody, um, I feel like I'm like I'm an intra like I'm a trusted soul, like that I was the safe person for them to bring their truth to. And um, so for me, when I come out of those really heavy situations, and I don't quite know what to do with all the energy and all that feeling. Like I'll sit in my car and I will just, I'll pray and I'll just give it to God. And I'll tell God, I, I got this person as far as I could today, but this person still really needs divine intervention from you. And I need you to take this from me. And that's kind of how I'm able to transition from one big scenario to the next. Cause I literally could be working with somebody in crisis and 15 minutes later, I'd be working with somebody in a completely different crisis. And so that's like the best way for me to be able to kind of transition and still be fully present for the next person. So on the really big, heavy days, though, when I just too much and I don't want to take all the energy into my house, like when it's just been too much and I'm still feeling really weighed down, um, I'll smudge before I go in the house just to kind of get the sage to help me clear the energy so that when I walk in, because I'm also a single mom. So when I walk into my kids, I need to be fully present with them, too. So that's just what I do. Okay, um, I see on the uh, awesome. Thank you for that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to skip. 
thank you for uh, sharing your practices in letting go of other people's heaviness. Um, I see Charity says, don't forget us folks with our hands raised. What's up, Charity? Yeah, hi, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, in our small group, I just kind of wanted to reiterate something one of um, the group members had said, because I think it was a really great point um, coming from uh, Jay. Um, and he made the point that you know, sometimes our self-care is, you know, really related to the environment that we work in um, or the corporation that we work for. And, you know, I've had some, you know, pretty personal experience with that. Uh, before I became a peer, uh, I was working in a school program and we had, you know, a great team with like a, a therapist and uh, an educator and, you know, um, just several clinicians and they were all very supportive and we had dealt with all kinds of stuff you know um lots of crisis uh assaults um you know destruction of property um and we were constantly having to um you know move and jive with whatever was thrown at us but i always felt at you know my job there i always felt uh, like I could take on anything, you know, I, and no matter what the clients were doing or, you know, what had happened that day, because I had the support of my team, I really was able to, um, it didn't affect me so deeply. Uh, but I think in these like larger uh, groups, like I work for uh, Greater Lake, you know, it's, it's a big office. And even though we have a small team, I think sometimes things can get, um, you know, like a disconnection, like as, as far as, you know, really working together and supporting one another. And I just think that was a really great point because I think sometimes it's not so much about uh, us getting caught up, but it's, it's having that lack of support um, and just not a very good uh, system within the organization that you work for. Absolutely. Thank you, Charity. Um, and that's, that is a great segue I, uh, into our next topic. And for the sake of time, I'd like to move on if um, that's okay. I do see that Willie, Paul, and Daniel have their hands up. Are you, uh, were you, is that because you're wanting to share something? Oh, Willie, you're uh, muted. Uh-oh, I got it. Before you clicked over, I was thinking about lack in a relationship. To me, a lack reflects a stumbling block. And first of all, in a relationship, we're supposed to assume positive intent, okay? But depend on what type of relationship that is. Client, staff, parent, child, coworker, et cetera whatever type of relationship, if there's a lack, then you got to assume positive before you think otherwise, because we all have a tendency to evaluate the other person and we're not necessarily right all the time. So conceiving a relationship has a lot to do with interpreting it. Okay, if, if you assume about a person, and you could be way off, way wrong in your assumption. Then there could be a language difference, say that person, like if it's a younger person, they have, I don't mean this specifically, but they have kind of like a little street mentality, you know, how we were when we were kids, teenagers. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot different than mature adults. So that could be part of the lack of relationship. And that's almost like evaluating a person. So we can't assume there's lack. We might feel lack or imagine lack, but that other person may not be thinking there's a lack. I'm done. Yeah, that's a that's really great, uh, Willie. Ass assumptions get us very not very far, right? And so uh, those open, honest conversations can help us kind of our perception restore mutuality too. Um, if, if even if the other person doesn't think there's a lack of mutuality. Um, 
Okay, is everyone cool with us uh, jumping on to our next group of slides? Yep, all right, cool. So we're gonna talk about co-reflection. I know some of you have experience with uh, co-reflection. Um, what is co-reflection? So it's a vital tool for peer staff and organizations who employ them. This is a group meeting held at least once a month. Uh, one peer staff should attend co-reflection, only peer staff should attend co-reflection meetings. Uh, this meeting helps PSS or peer support specialists. That's what the CPSS is, a certified peer support specialist. I know you guys have different initials in different states, but um, avoid peer drift or the tendency to act as a clinical staff member. So peer support that operate with a whole bunch of other clinicians can have the tendency as of no fault of their own to start to talk and think like clinical staff because that's what they're surrounded by. It's super hard to maintain our autonomy and our peer support um, scope of mind if we're surrounded by clinicians. So um, if, your peer, if your organization has a bunch of peer staff, hosting your own co-reflection meeting monthly is the best practice because then you can make sure everyone um, in your agency um, has support, you guys have, are building relationships, and you guys can kind of talk about um, specific issues you have going on without worrying as much about HIPAA and 42 CFR because they're people that also work in your agency. Um, if your organization only employs one or two peer staff, you can explore regional co-reflections. Um, and we provide a statewide co-reflection, but we're considering um, expanding that. So if other states are needing co-reflection, um, we can do that over Zoom, um, just because we think it's such an important, vital piece of peer support, feeling supported in their work. Can I get a raise of hands if your team uses co-reflection? Lots of people. Oh, someone from Delaware is calling me. All right. So quite a few. Awesome. So I'm just going to share how we do co-reflection. Um, we're not saying this is the only way or the absolute right way. It's just the way that we found to work best for um, our peer staff here in Nebraska. Where's my, my pointer? Boop, there we go. Okay, so our recommended format is a group co-reflection about current events within work and life. So maybe talking a little bit about personal life, talking a little bit about what's going on at work currently. Um, reflection about self-care. So utilizing that self-care check-in, I try to do that at least once a quarter when I'm leading a co-reflection so that everyone can kind of recheck in and see how they're doing. Cause my self-care check-in varies depending on what's going on in my life. Um, reviewing the domains or core competencies within your preferred training. So I heard that some people do use IPS. Um, we wrote a curriculum, the periodical peer support uh, curriculum. Uh, and there's what, there's the one Arkansas is using with um, was Appalachian and there's all sorts of different types of uh, so everyone has different core competencies and domains. INAPS also has their own so you could use those. Um, reviewing issues related to working with others. So maybe I'm having an issue uh, connecting or building a solid relationship with someone and other people in my co-reflection might have some tips or some experience that I can learn from. Reviewing successes of peer support specialists and participants. So I love that part. It's my favorite part when we can like, hey, hey, like when somebody gets their certificate or when somebody gets like a, um, a participant gets housed and they've been living on the street forever and they finally get an apartment, like it's time to have a dance party. I also dance a lot. So um, you know, you don't have to dance or get excited like I do, but I'm going to. Um, 
discussion on organizational culture as it's affected by peer support specialists. So, um, you know, sometimes there can be some pushback and like we can we can talk about that openly in peer support uh, co reflection. And then discussion around how the group can support one another in the next month. So if I'm struggling during this co reflection, I might say, y'all can support me this month by checking in once a week and just checking and seeing how I'm doing and being a listening ear. Um, do you guys have any other uh, opinions or uh, topics that you think would be important in co reflection and then we're going to take a break. Okay, so this practice greatly increases our organization's effectiveness, consistency, and retention of peer support staff. Um, that being said, we're going to go ahead and take our five-minute break now. Um, we will be back at uh, 12.08.
All right. It's 12.07. We, got, we still got 30 seconds or so. Marissa, do you have a comment or question? No, I just forgot to put my hand back down. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for asking though. I appreciate your attention. Okay. Um, I saw that Sean said it's important to remember that I don't have burnout from working in these pop with these populations. I have burnout caused by broken systems that prohibit our folks from finding recovery. Thank you for that, Sean. Um and then also, I keep trying to, I'm trying to move Danielle's mouse <laughs> from my computer. Uh, so you talk about peers, uh, peer relationships with clinicians and how loneliness impacts the brain. Those are great topics for co-reflection. All right, um, we are gonna talk about frequent misconceptions. So, um, we don't necessarily have time to go super in depth in all of these, but if you want a further explanation, you can speak up when we get to that question. Can a practicing clinician lead or participate in co-reflection? The short answer is no, um, because we want it to be peer led and peer attended only. Um, so the short answer is no. Uh, somebody with a clinical license who's working as a peer support can absolutely attend. Is co-reflection time to vent about other practitioners in my agency or community? No. Um, the, there's a really interesting um, class that you can take for free from Yale called um, the Science of Well-Being. And there's a lot of science around how us focusing or venting about the things that are um, annoying to us, we think that that makes us feel better. But the reality is it doesn't. It just brings more of that to our attention um, and within our awareness. So focusing more on um, our, our gratitude um, actually focus actually increases our happiness. That's another whole nother conversation, but uh, the answer to the co-reflection venting is no. Um, who leads co-reflection? Uh, peers, it can be co-led, it could be um, led by a peer support supervisor that's a peer, um, or you could just have uh, no leader and just have like times set on how long you're gonna talk about things so that you don't run out of time. Uh, someone shared a boundary violation. What do you do? Does anybody have an answer for that? Someone shared a boundaries violation with you in co-reflection. Do we report them? Usually I'll take them aside and talk to them in a private setting and explain the yeses and the noes and kind of work through it with them. Hopefully they come up with the appropriate answer theirself. Totally. So we, yeah, as peer support, we believe in natural consequences and we're not, uh, we don't inflict consequences on people. So um, we can have a conversation about how, uh, what we might do, what they think they might do now that they've shared that, but um, we don't just run and, you know, tell someone. Um, it seems like another pointless meeting to attend. That's something that we hear a lot. And um, what we have to say is, well, it's pointless if you don't mind uh, spending the money to hire another. Oh, there's my husband. You guys, can you guys all see that text? <laughs> my husband just texted me. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's pointless if you don't mind paying to employ another peer support specialist when they're, um, when all your peers burn out and quit. Uh, but it's really not pointless if you're not trying to spend money trying to rehire people. So, um, what if we don't have anyone that does co-reflection in our area? Start one or contact us and we'd be happy to have you in our co-reflection. 
Um, it's hard to keep folks on tr track. They want to spend the meeting complaining. We had this comment from a peer run organization um, here in Nebraska. And um, my response was just what we talked about setting time limits. So we're going to spend 15 minutes talking about this thing and 20 minutes talking about this thing um, so that we don't get too lost in the weeds. Um, and then, of course, there's times when something really serious is going on. Say, for instance, someone we all work with passed away. We might spend the majority of co-reflection just kind of supporting each other about that and kind of drop some of the other topics for the next time. Any questions or comments about these common misconceptions? I know I'm preaching to the choir, all y'all probably believe in co-reflection, even if you don't do it. So, um, but these are, I like to have, um, I don't know, arguments or supporting evidence for other practitioners too. You have something? Okay. Yeah. All right. We're gonna fly through supervision, but we're gonna talk about it. So there's a difference uh, between clinical consultation and peer supervision. Um, and a peer supervisor could be responsible for both. Um, how many of you, can I just get a quick raise of hands? How many of you have to have clinical consultation to bill for peer support? Like a clinician running through your caseload, reviewing your caseload and your services. Okay. A few of you. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to talk about consultation and this applied to no one we were talking to. Um, okay, so supervision, we call it coaching at our agency. Um, it's commonly called supervision. Uh, supervisors will review job duties, uh, coach about competencies of peer support, uh, check in about peer support well being, mentor and coach community partnerships and projects. So, we do stretch projects where you kind of stretch yourself. Um, mentor and professional relationship building, manage time cards, avoid, uh, at, sorry, advocate for peer voice in leadership. So, especially in clinical organizations, it's really important for peer supervisors to be that peer voice at the table that says, this is how we do things. Review challenges and successes within relationships uh, uh, with participants. Manage uh, new admissions and discharges. Uh, check in with boundaries and self-care. And um, supervisors for peer support specialists commonly meet once a week should be conducted by a person who identifies as a peer um, and or at minimum has taken peer support 101 and some provider education so they have an understanding of what peer support is um, and it is not clinical consultation so supervision is not running down someone's caseload um, coaching supervision is uh, really about the person's job not about their caseload um, that's more clinical consultation, which we will move on to next. Any question about supervision? Dan have? Yeah, Daniel said, I, I do, yet I have not had it in months. So I think that was clinical consultation. You, Daniel, you have con clinical consultation, but you haven't had it in months? Yeah, we've been, um, <clears throat> we're a small team, we're multidisciplinary. We have law enforcement, EMS, downtown court, and mental health. And I'm under the mental health. And my supervisor has, we have a morning meeting, only been there occasionally because she has other duties because of COVID. Okay. Uh, we're still working out on the streets. So it's been making it interesting. Yeah. And not having that proper co clinical consultation can also be um, can be a challenging piece. Um, both supervision and consultation are beneficial to peer support in different ways. How do you get buy-in from, like we have a monthly meeting and 
we went for vote and and it became peer to, to distinguish the difference the peer and a non-peer leading the group to the non-peer leading the group and we're trying the month thingy but we have a lot of peers that, that we will be unruly how to get that buy-in that yeah we can lead our own meetings yeah, absolutely, Daniel. I think that's a lot about kind of educating the difference between the two. And also some of this information, I think, in the slides would be super beneficial to take back and say, hey, you know, this would really support us. Um, do you have multiple peers working within your um, multidisciplinary team or just one? You're breaking up a little. Um, in my department, I'm the only peer, okay. but in our larger agency, we have 26 and we're hiring another 20. Yeah, I, and I, I Daniel, I, I often get, um, get in leadership space a little bit when it comes to this. Uh, you said like, how do we get buy-in that peer support can run their own meeting? Well, I don't know, but to me, that sounds like you think the people that you're serving and the people that have lived experience are capable of less than people that don't have lived experience. Um, and that's problematic, right? Um, so sometimes just that needs to be brought to the attention of leadership that there's like a weird bias going on that they're not, they're just kind of subconsciously putting out there. Um, because if we don't believe that the people we're serving are capable as of as much as anybody else, then what are we doing, right? Well, what are, what are we actually getting at? So that might be a conversation about some implicit biases going on. Um, okay, are we, is there something else? I think there's just some comments. Daniel, there's just some comments in the chat book, box too for you from some of the participants in the group. Okay, so clinical consultation can be led by like uh, a, a therapist or a clinician, a, a doctor or a nurse. <laughs> oh, stop, honey, stop texting me. Okay, um, and they run through our roster and make sure that there is medical, um, that there is medical necessity for peer support, which is funny because peer support is completely optional. So if the person says that they're still benefiting from peer support, that's medical necessity in my opinion, but um, that might be running through with a clinician. Um, in some states, peer support supervisors is an actual certification and that is a uh, clinical consultations able to be done by peer support supervisors. Um, it could be a combo meeting with case managers, uh, therapists, nurses, and doctors. Um, and Medicaid often requires that you have your caseload signed off on by a clinician, however many times a month that they require for your state. So that's the difference between supervision and clinical consultation. Uh, clinical consultants and supervisors might oversee the documentation piece of peer support. Um, we just say peer support specialist first priority is the relationship. So if, if documentation is getting in the way of building relationships, supervisory guidance and time management might be needed um, to be addressed. So um, the supervisor might want to look at the requirements for um, documentation if it's getting in the way of building relationships. Um, do we have any comments? I think we're, nope. Okay. I'm sorry I'm moving so quickly. I just do want to get us to our last little exercise, which um, is about boundaries. Um, performance improvement measures. So this kind of talks a little bit about what Daniel was talking about. We don't think peer support should be held at a different standard than other, um, other employees. It, it's actually a little bit discriminatory to hold us at different standards. And it doesn't give us the dignity and respect of the profession that we are. Um, and a lot of times we're certified to have more training than even case managers in some states. So um, 
as far as creating performance improvement plans, if a, a peer is not meeting the needs of their job, um, it should they shouldn't be held to a different standard. Uh, leaders of recovery oriented organizations know that people in recovery are some of the most resilient people in our community and their capacity for growth and self improvement should not be underestimated. So we want to keep high standards of fidelity to the peer support model, use strengths based goal setting for peer support specialists professional development. Uh, provide professional development opportunities outside of peer support. So like um, you guys all got to come to this conference and that's a professional development opportunity. So there's a couple things in the chat box that I yes. just want to. So Allie, Allie said, what if I'm just learning from this training that I'm receiving clinical consultation and not supervision led to support my job as a peer support specialist from my supervisor? I want to take this information back to my supervisor and also start receiving this supervision that is more peer support led. Can I receive this from MHAAO? So this may be a um, Mary Ann question. Um, if not, our, our agency could support that, um, but I think this is more of a question for Mary Ann. Let me, let me run through this real quick. Um, let's see, let's change it. Maybe, and maybe, maybe you can comment back in the I, chat. I can do that. Go ahead and move on. Okay. Awesome. And um, and then the other one is also I receive information on where to attend co-reflection so I can begin to introduce this meeting to my team and agency. Yes, absolutely. Ali, if you want to put your email in the chat box, we would definitely invite you to our co-reflection. We do it bi-monthly here in Nebraska, but it would be a chance for you to um, introduce it to your team so that you guys can kind of formulate what my, it might look like for your agency moving forward, if that would be helpful. Awesome. And we can just also put that link in with our slides too, if that's helpful. Um, and then, oh man, we got five minutes left. We're not going to get to our last activity, but that's okay. Um, allow peer providers to develop mentoring relationships with other leaders within and outside your organization. So having that mentoring relationship where you learn to grow professionally is, is super important to maintaining peer support within uh, retention. Um, we have some info here about ADA and job accommodations. Just so you guys know, only about 4% of accommodations uh, result in ongoing expenses for an agency. So your agency should be uh, able to support any reasonable accommodations you might have for a disability. There are no specific impairments defined by the ADA that uh, count as a disability. So that would just be you requesting uh, with written documentation to your agency. Um, and it is uh, okay to terminate someone that's not doing their job if the termination has nothing to do with their disability. They're not meeting the requirements from their job um, with or without reasonable accommodations or because of the disability um the person uh, poses a direct threat to the health or safety of the workplace all right well i'm just gonna like really quick boundaries you guys are gonna get these slides um and this could have probably been its own presentation, right, uh, about boundaries. They're so important. And maybe next year we will do a boundaries presentation. But um, the, that is, this is the most important piece to keeping peer support um, legitimate and respected, is us showing that we have healthy boundaries. We have a boundaries check-in. We ask people to do this. If we had time, you'd be split up in groups, first as your personal boundaries, and then as your professional boundaries, and seeing how those look different, right? Um, so how often do we say no? Do we speak up when we're uh, in a disagreement with someone? Uh, there's several questions here, and we use this in our co-reflection probably twice a year to check in with everybody about their boundaries. Um, and then 
we use self-disclosure, but it might not be useful to use self-disclosure uh, with clinical staff as their hidden biases might come to the surface. So we want to make sure that we are understanding our professional boundaries might be different with our participants and with clinicians that we work with, depending on the culture of our agency. Yeah, we have a question? Okay. Um, so we do have a provider employee training. Um, if your agency might benefit, you have some clinicians that are trying to support peer support, but people just keep burning out and quitting. Um, we do provide a training for that and we'd be happy to provide that for um, your agency, just reach out to us. Um, it's something that we're really passionate about, creating sustainable workforce uh, for peer support. And our last questions here are about developing boundaries. So we use these with brand new peer support and then tell peer support that they can use these in helping participants develop healthy boundaries. Um, so this is a great tool for participants. So I'll address it. Okay. Um, did, I'm so sorry we had to rush through that. I could have managed time better. I just wanted to hear everything you guys had to say. Does anybody have any questions, final questions or comments about um, what we've shared today? I have a question. Um, uh, I, I was wondering, uh, have you ever had to deal with um, teams who uh, you know are really great and they're set uh, and then somebody leaves and it's it's really hard to integrate the new person into the team. What do you do with that? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, it's uh, the person in peer support entering a peer support team. Yeah, okay. So uh, co-reflection in my experience is a really great way to do that. Um, sometimes I, uh, especially if we have a couple new people, I'll, I'll take co-reflection time and take us all out of the building or like to a restaurant or something. Like we all just go and we go into a non-work setting together and kind of have some team building time, maybe go to an escape room or go bowling just to kind of create that team um, use that co-reflection time for team building and for a little stress relief. So a couple of things just to just to jump in. There's a bunch of stuff coming in the chat box. If, chat box. If you have not given us given us your email and you would like these slides or just our contact information, um, will you please put your email in the chat box? And we would love to even have further conversations about the this presentation or any other presentation that we might have, or however we can be supportive of you as a peer or in your in your employment also. Um, and then part of the email that we will send out with the slides will be Sadie and I's email so that you guys can get in contact with us if you. Have have any other questions for sure. Sadie and Dan Danielle, thank you so much. Marianne, will you leave this open just for a few minutes? So I, I will. Can? Okay, I so will. so much coming in right now in the chat box and I'm not keeping up with it. So that would be awesome if we could just have about five minutes after this, but I would love to stay in contact yeah. with all of you guys and um, no share. Worries. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Sweet.